Hello, welcome to this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is a reader and audience member that we're trying out. Um, and um, we don't know each other, but it is Stephen Kennedy. And Stephen, would you um, introduce yourself to us? Good day, Kevin. Thank you very much for having me on the show. My name is Stephen Kennedy. I'm a documentary photographer. That's great. Um, and you do um, documentary meaning like video or do you mean like still? Still photographs exclusively. Okay. That's a big distinction these days. It is very big. Yes. Okay. I come from a photojournalism background and the nature of my work is a long form documentary currently with artists on a specific project called great. Cross Country Camera. Wow. Okay. Fabulous. Well, welcome to the Cool Tool Show and Tell. I know you have um, at least four tools that you'd like to share with us. Um, so, Stephen, tell us about your first tool. The first tool is a book, and it's called The War of Art. It's by Stephen Pressfield. It's just a little over 20 years old, and it is... The kind of book that you have a copy of it to show us. I do. I have it right here. Okay. Um, I think I've purchased this book maybe uh, twelve or thirteen times. I it buy looks it. Like it's a regular trade paperback, not very big, um, and we maybe a hundred, couple hundred pages, maybe at the most. Couple hundred, a couple hundred pages. It's a fast read. Okay. Uh, Stephen Pressfield is a writer and a screenwriter and a novelist. And he wrote this book 20 years ago. And it's really, it speaks to the artist in everybody. It talks about the things that block us and how to overcome these obstacles. And uh, it's it's the kind, it's really becomes the gas in the tank. It, it will motivate and inspire. And I just can't imagine not having this book. What did, it, what did it do for you specifically? How did it change either how you worked or whether you worked? What, what precisely did it do for you? It really helped me identify the things that are emotionally uh, in the way of creation. Uh, Stephen Pressfield calls this force that we battle every day, the resistance. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how the resistance can be self-sabotaging and about how it can be in the way. However, it also talks about how it can be vanquished every day mm -hmm. and that it will be an ongoing companion in our creative journey. So once you identify it and learn how to deal with it, then you can get to work. And is this something, his book, that you need to kind of keep going back to to be reminded of? Or are there other insights in the book that you get each time you read it? Uh, it's, it's actually both. Uh, even though I have systemized my, my life and my creative process, sometimes the, the wheels come off of the 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 machine and I have to rebuild or uh, reassess and this helps me do it and your second point I always find something new in the words something that resonates with me in the moment or is uh, a discovery of a of a problem I might have been kind of chewing on in in, in the background. Okay and um. There's a paperback version. I imagine that there's also audible versions. There, all of the versions. In fact, I have the very first audible version, which has since been superseded. So the the voice actor in that is named George Quiddell, who read it. And that is no longer available on Audible. However, oh. I have a copy on every device because there's something about the combination of the voice actor's delivery with the author's words that strike an emotional chord with me. Okay. And again, that book is called The 
The War of Art. Art. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I have read the book, and then and then I found it. Um, there were some great insights in into it in terms of, um, as you say, overcoming the resistance. What what, what the, those those sort of natural hurdles and obstacles that you have that you have to kind of get over. So for for people right. who struggle with that, it is it is a good book. So thanks for that reminder. So Stephen, what's uh what's what's your second uh, tool that you'd hate to, to lose or be without? Well, once I get the inspiration from the book and I'm out in the world, I have a Fujifilm mm-hmm. X100V. This is the fifth iteration of this camera. Could you hold and it up so we can see it a little bit better? I can. Right, so so you're, for people who are listening, it's a um, fairly small-ish um, camera. Um, yes. And uh, it looks kind of like an uh, old-fashioned type with um a very square rectangular body and a single lens in the middle of it in the old days we used to call those range finders but there's a screen on the back yes this is a purely digital camera um the manufacturer is called fuji film however it is not a film camera but it does uh they are a film company uh, they still make film but they make a line separate lines of digital cameras, uh, including an instant digital that it very much mimics that right. of a Polaroid. Uh, the current project I'm involved in uh, is uh, involves me going to artist studios all over the U.S. Uh, this camera uh, is, a, is a masterpiece of technology. And it allows me to work without any ancillary um, supplemental lighting or any ancillary accessories. It's this very tiny camera, which is becomes invisible to the subject very shortly. So having very little equipment in between myself and the subject allows me to establish a rapport with the subject and allows them to be themselves. So I do like the fact that this is a very um, innocuous piece of equipment. However, the technology is remarkable. It is a, as you said, a rangefinder camera, a digital impl- implementation of that, but it captures uh, these high resolution images, which I have um made 30 inch by 40 inch prints i've created a number of books with this uh and then fine art prints so the the quality is astonishing and fuji of course is known for their color science so when the photographs are finished i have this fuji color science built in which is a huge assistance to me in the post-production phase So there are other kind of similar cameras. There's Leicas these days, digital Leicas. There's Sony's and stuff. So, so have you done a lot of? Have you used a lot of these other ones and done comparisons? Is there a particular reason why um, this particular model camera is is the one that works best for you? This is a little different than the Sony's. Uh, first of all, we live in a golden age of digital photography where uh, the bar is so high for excellence. Every camera that you could get is astonishingly good. Yeah. And it's and it's a, a thousand or a hundred times better than it was just 10 years ago. No matter what exactly. you just digital camera that you buy today. Exactly. Uh, the closest comparison with this might be a digital Leica. Uh, I have not tested the Leicas. However, I have used Sony's Nikon, Canon, um, Pentax with success. There is something, again, it goes back to the diminutive size. And the fact that this is a fixed focus lens, it gives a 35 millimeter field of view. So if you're uh in the old s kind of wide angle ish for those who who don't know it's a slightly wide angle that is correct not quite as wide as you would get on your mobile phone 
Um, but uh, because it, the lens is integrated with the camera, the uh, ability for low light photography and uh, it's an f2.0 lens. So uh, mm -hmm. it can give you a at kind of a wide open, mm -hmm. there's the Japanese word bokeh right. for that. Uh, the combination of all of that together uh, in its uh, in its simplicity is the real appeal to me. Right. You, you said it was fixed focus, but you meant more it was a fixed um, focal or range. It wasn't. You, you still Correct. So when you see this, there the lens does not zoom. Right. So if you uh, if you want to you want to zoom, it's a sneaker zoom. Right. So you have to move in right. Right. Yeah. or pull back. Right. You're a physical person. So um, what does it cost? It's about fourteen hundred U.S. dollars. So so one distinction between it and the Leica is that it's a lot cheaper than the, than the Leica. Is. By a by a noticeable multiple. Yeah, yes, exactly. So maybe you could say that this is more of affordable Leica uh, rangefinder. Well, without stirring up the the Leica fateful, one could one <laughs> could say that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, this so um, and and say the the model it's the Fujifilm. What is it called again? It's the X one hundred V. Also, V, it's the fifth iteration. So the V may be a hint, hint to a Roman numeral five. Yes. Right. right. Um, okay. And um, uh, yeah, so, so the kind of photography that this is really good for is this sort of stealthy, you know, you're kind of, the, you're the ninja. They're, you're not really, um, the camera is not to be paid attention to. It looks, it's sort of something that disappears. You're exactly right. And, and that again is, is one of the strongest um, draws for me. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, w one of the things that rangefinder types were very known for in the old days was that they were silent. Uh, there wasn't that clicky clack that the uh, mirror dropping back and down was, which was involved in the the um, single end reflexes, and so uh, that was another attribute of making them invisible was that they were silent. Yes, uh, I assume that this one is also silent. It is. It is silent, even more silent than its digital um, peers. Right. I I use Lumixes and. Um, Point and shoots mostly, and 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 one of the reasons was was because they were completely silent, um, and for the kind of photography I did, that was a, a big thing. So, right. um, that's really great. Okay, so Stephen, what's um, what's your third tool? Your third pick? Well, I'm going in order here, so I've had the inspiration from the book. I've created the photographs from the session. Now comes the uh, multi-step. Uh, post-production process. And my very first step and the most important software I use is called Photo Mechanic. And it's strictly for organization, fast editing, and by editing, I mean selection of images and for implementing all of the important data that is related to the photo session that will reside in the digital files for perpetuity for my archiving system. So Photo Mechanic is a bit of a Swiss Army knife. You bring the, the finished files into the computer. Uh, Photo Mechanic runs on Windows and Mac. Uh, it is a desktop uh, software. Uh, because it works with the embedded a uh, preview file, it is not rendering images, so it's not rendering the raw files, which makes it lightning fast. So, uh, for instance, I my background is in photojournalism, so I still have these editing processes that are based on film. So it's quick, 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 decide what is a keeper and what is for the file. Um, and then once I've made these decisions, I'll 
enter in all this pertinent data. So uh, it's almost any mainstream imaging software can work with metadata. However, Photomechanic is far superior than anything else is out there. So once I've identified my my select images, then it goes through three more steps um, before it gets a finished file for reproduction. Okay. So the 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 standard common version of this is Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom. Yes. Um, so so uh, um, and, and that is almost ubiquitous in many many uh, you know workflows. Why? How is Photo Mechanic uh, distinguish itself from Lightroom? Uh, I'm a Lightroom user. In fact, Lightroom is stop number three for okay. for my files. Uh, however, Photo Mechanic's ability to custom apply metadata in a variety uh, of fields for my distinct uses is much more robust than the capability in Lightroom. So give me a specific example of something that it's doing that you couldn't do before. Uh, adding keywords uh, from a, a standard taxonomy, I find to be significantly faster than doing it in Lightroom. I don't really have a picture. So you're, you 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 went to a session. You took some pictures of an artist working in the workshop. You've come back, and you want to do what? I want to identify that artist under a set of criteria based on my archiving system, and I can do that a lot faster in photo mechanics. So the you're difference tagging, between- you're, you're tagging, you're putting uh, some keywords onto all the images, the same- Correct, and, and those are embedded into the raw file so that even if down the road, an, uh, a sidecar file or an XMP file that uh, Lightroom will attach manage to, manages to get separated, I'll have this data via photo mechanic um, embedded for perpetuity. Okay. All right. So, and and that's, but, but it also does all the other kinds of things that Lightroom does as well. It does. However, I choose to use Lightroom for its strengths, which is the raw file conversion mm -hmm. and the, um, uh, all of the other kinds of heavy lifting that I would do prior to going into Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty, and so that's called Photo Mechanic, is that right? Photo Mechanic, it is, yes. It's, uh, the publisher is called Camera Bits. Um, they're based in the United States. It's a small team. Mm -hmm. They're very responsive to questions. They're very open to suggestions. Uh, a lot of their users are photographers like me, so it's uh, it's kind of a it, it's it's a niche product, but it's it's so important to my workflow. Yeah, and I great. can't imagine living without it. Great. So, uh, with that in mind, your fourth tool that you can't imagine living without, what would that be? Uh, the current project of mine is uh, involves photographing artists, and I have since. The, the project started in 2021, and in early 2022, I started producing digital books from each artist's session. So it's a monograph about the artist. I use a company called MagCloud, and they are a division of Blurb, which is an on-demand uh, digital printer. And MagCloud, I'm going to hold this up. This yeah. is a their biggest size. It's a tabloid size book. Uh, so when it's fully open, wow. it's it's wow. almost a, a meter yeah. wide. So for uh, listeners, um, it's um, uh, a spiral bound book that's very very large, oversized. And when he opens it up, it's actually the almost as wide as your arms are outstretched. I mean, it's huge. Um, 
and um, uh, presumably they do other kind of bindings besides the spiral bound? Uh, they do other bindings. Um, however, their choices are limited, not quite um, Model T, any color you want, as long as it's black. However, there are very few choices. And that's uh, one of the reasons their prices are astonishingly low. Yeah. So uh, this this is volume seven in my series, and it's a 38-page book. Mm -hmm. It's somewhere around $16 to print. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a distribution and fulfillment system. So I can order books for um, people and have them printed and drop shipped from the printer. Yeah. Uh, Blurb specializes in photo books and MagCloud is a little bit more like magazines because they often will do staple stitched yes. uh, versions of things. And the prices are a little bit more reasonable that you could issue magazine um, like um, printed things that aren't really, really thick. They're the kind of the smaller things. And so I usually associate MagCloud with people who are producing zines, magazines, and things that are not yes. hardbound covers with uh, perfect bindings on the ends. Blurb does more of, of the, the, the mother company does more of that. Right, right. And this MagCloud has a, they have some rudimentary uh, design tools, which are pretty good. Uh, I happen to work with a book designer, and um, when the when the design is finished, we upload a PDF to mm -hmm. MagCloud sized for the output. Right. And literally, the if if we're we're very close, and maybe we're not a hundred percent certain that it's the finished one. We'll just run a single book and within four or five days, I'll have a copy in hand. My book designer will have a copy in his hand and we'll say yes, no, maybe, and mm -hmm. then push the button for the rest of the the output. Do they work with color profiles? They do not. Uh, we simply use an sRGB, right. um, pretty much as generic as you can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do a lot of um, blur books. I do a blur book, probably four, maybe four books a year. And um, I found that that they're pretty close to what I'm seeing on my monitor, given yes. the fact that one is, you know, one is a glowing screen, the other one's some reflective print, but, but given, yes. given that they're, they're actually pretty close. They're, 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 there's not usually big surprises. Let me put it that way. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. Uh, the quality is uh, astonishing to me. I I have a pigment-based uh, fine art printer in my office, and I could not come close to duplicating yeah. the volume without breaking the bank. Yeah. So a 38-page digital print, you know, digital book for this very modest amount of money is is remarkable yeah you could in theory print them up and then cut them out <laughs> and right prints almost as good as you could print with your printer yes um so that's so mag cloud that's a that's a great recommendation that's really fabulous um and and uh my assistant actually does a zine a magazine she and she was using mag cloud for a while to send out to all her subscribers and yeah uh it's you know if you want to get into zines or magazines that's that's a really great option it really is and it's a great it's a great creative tool because um again i'm going to hold this up because it's so big yes what, what, what are the actual dimensions do you know uh they call it the tabloid. I believe it's, it's like eleven by seventeen, or yeah, I, I want to say eleven and a quarter by seventeen and a half. Yeah, right. So that was the old, as you call, I think tabloid uh, or ledger. I think they may have even called it at one point. But, yeah. yeah. But when you have two of those pages together, that's a that, and you're you're in landscape mode. Can you right. also find it in vertical portrait mode? <laughs> well. I do believe they have other 
of these these spiral bound versions that are much uh, I, I'm not as conversant as I should be because once I saw this I said oh I'm gonna ch- I'm gonna test the biggest one yeah <laughs> and then I I got it and I I can't imagine being any smaller because this is really a counterpoint to the way so many people consume photography today which is on a handheld screen and while there is certainly nothing wrong with that um it does you don't have to consume everything on a screen print is a viable uh, and very compelling uh, way to look at the world and however it's just it's been supplanted to such a degree that it's um it really only exists on the margins and yeah, yeah. um there is something very different about seeing something very large where you can kind of fall into it and um, study it in a way that yes. you small screen. And there is a, 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 absolutely a different experience. Maybe we should have different words for it. So, Stephen, that's really been great. Thank you for those four tools. Um, what's your current passion? What are you excited these days about? And what are you working on that you want to share? I am about three quarters of the way finished with my current project which is called cross country camera which is what the books are about uh it exists on the web mostly right now well entirely but i don't know that i'll have a book for every artist i've since uh mid 2021 i visited artist studios in the 35 states i've in fact just an hour ago i've put the wraps on a uh, printmaker uh, and painter in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm talking to you from my hotel room in Birmingham. Um, We just wrapped. She was the 77th artist of this project, and Alabama is the 35th state. I hope to get to all 50 states within the next nine months, so I have 15 to go. And... um, It'll be my second time around to all 50 states in the US. My work has taken me abroad as well. I've worked in 26 countries. The cross country camera is really my biggest obsession at the moment. And uh, when that wraps, I have a couple of other things that hopefully will be uh, ready to go to take its place. So uh, on on your journey, the cross country camera photographing artists at work, I presume, or is it? That's correct. Is it portraits? It's artists, at artists work. at work in their studio, and right. uh, portraits are a component of the right. photo essays. How how are you choosing the artists? Is there a heuristic that you have? Is there is there some qualifications or category um, that you are using to select the artists that you are watching? Uh, it started as a simple Google search with the search criteria best visual artist and then this then the city name um this is a self-financed project so i have to the biggest cost is travel sure so i'll find the place that i think i can go to first and then i will look for the artist Mm. now that the project is mature most of the choices are based on recommendations from other artists who I've met along the way. So um, these sessions are become de facto master classes that I get to observe with these artists in their in their places of work and or inspiration. So as I move forward to the next place, I'll I'll try to find I'll look up some of my new acquaintances and say, mm-hmm. hey, I'm going to be in Pensacola for, do you know anyone? And, uh, but if that doesn't work out, I still go back to the right. Google best visual <laughs> art. And then I'll, I'll drill down from there. Sure. And then I'll, I'll send out a, a cold query. And um, about two out of five take me up on it. That's pretty high. I think that's maybe. Yeah, that's good. That's that's a good sign of humanity. <laughs> I, I will also say that um, 
I do have a, a page on my on this project website uh -huh. for people to nominate. Okay. Um, nominate artists or for artists to self nominate. Right. And that has that's about twenty percent of the mm -hmm. the total. And the um um is there a have you found generally that there's been kind of a natural bias or natural tendency for certain kind of art art to show up versus others you know i i don't know do you have uh, you have printmakers I'm, i mean what what's the range of uh well it, it is almost entirely um visual however there are some uh i have photographed about a dozen sculptors who work in various uh various mediums mostly right. metal um and then i've done some ceramic and pottery artists as well i think my own personal bias is toward printers printmakers and painters because i am a frustrated printmaker and painter okay. and uh so that's that's probably why i i have such an affinity for those and um just to complete the 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 view of your project do you also interview them are there is there any text that's accompanying these images well in the when i'm finished with the session i will ask the artist to share his or her artist statement mm. and then that artist statement become the supporting text for the project mm -hmm. that they are also included in the book so all of the texts i will see if i can pull one up so for instance uh, this artist mm -hmm. her name is glenisha johnson she's in kansas city and then she was kind enough to share her artist statement and from that um we pulled those okay those very powerful words and incorporated those with the sure. pictures that's really great well that's a fantastic project um it sounds like you have a deliverable at the end which is really great and i presume there'll be some way for people to um purchase one or get one uh, of uh, whatever it is that you produce at the end. So we'll have, yes. if you can send us the links to those, that'll be helpful. We can put it into the show notes. Okay, uh, great. And it's called Cross Country Camera? It is, yes. Okay. It's a great, it's a great thing. I have a dream of that, doing that someday, getting in a van driving across and um, seeing the fantastic things that people are doing cre creatively across the country there's a lot more people doing these things than you would imagine it's the again it's the digital tools that have allowed us to be the publishers of our own work to not you know to be the distributor to be the printing press and it's it is a dream come true for me yeah. i yeah. i had my first i had my first published picture 42 years ago <laughs> when i was 15 years old and it came off of a ratty uh daily newspaper printing press and i thought gosh if i could have all the money in the world i would have my own printing press <laughs> and now you do <laughs> and now i do yes <laughs> well that's really fantastic Stephen, thank you for your time, for sharing with us your tools and um, and your passion. Um, I wish you the best success in completing your um, current project and the ones to come. I'm sure there are going to be more. So um, thanks again. This has been a real treat. Thank you very much. This year, our Cool Tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year, and I'm inviting our guests and listeners 
to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking all, talking on a video and um, you need to have some tools that you can show. Um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way. Um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something you use to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you. <laughs>